All right, we'll go ahead and get started since it's five minutes past. Thank you so much for joining. Um, I'm going to pass the, the mic over to Dr. Rudy. We'll be going through all things biohacking 101, unleashing your body's full potential. Um, you can follow us on Insta follow Dr. Rudy on Instagram. You can see his Instagram handle below. And I will uh, pass it over to Dr. Rudy to introduce himself and begin the webinar. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining. Sasha, can you hear me okay? Yep. Cool. So I'm Dr. Rudy Gehrman. I'm a founder and CEO of a integrated medical wellness and Pilates center based in downtown Brooklyn. We also have a Pilates studio on the Upper East Side, um, but our functional medicine department operates around the world. So we've definitely taken a step in the direction of virtual and virtual service offerings. We have literally patients all through the United States, Canada, uh, Europe, uh, Pakistan, kind of, uh, you name it, we're, we're seeing patients uh, delivering functional medicine and, and integrative nutrition. So it's been pretty cool to see um, see that expand. But uh, we're having a biohacking conversation today. And, um, you know, if you guys can kind of save your questions and answers, but it's we're, we're trying to do webinars a little bit more casual these days and not have it so much of a lecture, but more of a QA, and a um, just to kind of we can all learn from each other and we can learn from our questions and answers and have a sharing moment. So uh, feedback after this would be very much appreciated, but think of your questions as I kind of go through this, but just wanted to tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I was an athlete my whole life. Uh, I played very competitive uh, ice hockey from a young age and we were actually studied by the University of Buffalo when we were um, younger. And I would, I would kind of look at that as their sports medicine department was testing us um, and and challenging us as we as we perform. So it was very natural for me. This new word biohacking. Uh, we were kind of like in a biohacking experiment throughout the course of my life, and we had you know varieties of different training techniques and nutritional stuff to get us to kind of perform at our peak. Um, I then ended up going to uh, college playing hockey and studying in, in biology and and uh, really kind of gravitated towards sports medicine. And I was looking for graduate schools and thinking of how I wanted to kind of take care of people. And uh, really the team chiropractors were always the ones that were very integrated in their thought um, and kind of forward thinking. Uh, so I went to New York Chiropractic College in New York, but uh, we had, I basically built out physiologic in my head prior to even going to grad school. And I never really understood why, um, you know, growing up, I'd have to go see the chiropractor or the orthopedist or the physical therapist or the acupuncturist or, you know, the athletic trainer. Every, no one was really under one roof. So we are a multidisciplinary clinic, but we are very much integrated. There's a big difference. We're not just kind of shingles inside, you know, under one roof. Um, we're constantly communicating about our patients. We're, uh, we're experimenting with, um, you know, different modalities and different departments. Um, and we have, and right after this, I've, as an example, we have a clinical team meeting where all the providers are going to be talking about our patients, interdepartmental, but also patients that we're co-treating. Um, we have, maybe if you could progress the slide, Sasha, thank you for helping. If you can go one more, if you wouldn't mind. And then this is more, you know, I started kind of getting into what is physiologic. Um, we are, we operate, uh, we have a variety of different departments. As I said, we have a functional medicine, integrated medicine department uh, with Dr. Patty de Blasio, um, trained in functional medicine. Uh, with her working is the clinical nutrition team led by Michelle Miller. Uh, so that's nutrition and health coaching. We'll kind of get into that, into this talk on some of the tools that they have in their toolbox that help our patients. Uh, we have a uh, non-surgical orthopedic department and regenerative medicine uh, that is led by Dr. Tanuj Palvia. Uh, we'll talk about that and some of the different tools they have in their toolbox. We have a, a sports chiropractic department uh, led by Dr. Steven Zaro, a physical therapy department uh, led by Dr. Sarah Rodriguez, uh, a massage therapy department. Uh, Amy Montilla uh, uh, runs that, and the Pilates studio is run by my wife, Linda. Uh, we all are also a teacher certification uh, for other Pilates uh, uh, students to become certified in Pilates. 
Um, each one of those departments, we do operate kind of, I like to call it the conventional medicine bubble, but we're operating in and out of conventional medicine. I don't like to use the word alternative medicine. Um, I think there's been a lot of information in that world. Uh, I, I call it more innovative medicine, where a lot of the modalities are clinically proven, scientifically uh, researched, and are typically like 10 to 20 years ahead of conventional medicine offerings. And that's one of the cool things that we can do operating in a private practice versus operating in a hospital. Uh, we can go out, gather, um, you know, put our, our smart heads together, find non-gimmicky modalities, and then get certified them in them and bring them to uh, our patient population. So um, a lot of the things that you're going to be hearing today are also kind of falling into this new word that's been phrased, biohacking. And what is biohacking? You know, it's, I look at it as people kind of trying to take their healthcare into their own hands. Um, a lot of times it's done by the person where they're collecting data through different uh, health apps, you know, everything from a whoop to an aura ring, looking at the, you know, understanding what their labs are. Um, you know, collecting their own uh, biometrics. And that's kind of where, you know, treatment begins. Um, we're going to be having a conversation today about there's a lot of, uh, unfortunately, a lot of misinformation out there and a lot of people that are kind of preaching and giving healthcare advice that are not uh, certified to do so. So I would just almost be like, you know, buyer beware, even with healthcare providers, you know, you always want to do your own diligence, but you really want to have someone kind of guiding and leading you in, you know, this conversation today is in, in these biohacking modalities, but I would really urge everybody to make sure that they have someone certified um, and is an expert in that uh, particular field. And like, even myself, I'm not an expert in every field. I use my, our, our own internal experts that we'll talk about today for various things. Like I know a lot of, a lot about most of the modalities that we do, but no better to go to with the expert that that's all they do is they're looking at the research. They're trying to figure out exactly how those modalities work. But again, biohacking is sometimes getting a, a bad rap. We just did Fox five news, did an interview with us um, just on what biohacking was. And I kind of spoke um, about sometimes, uh, you know, people are wasting money. Sometimes people are getting hurt because they're not really, they're kind of taking their healthcare too far into their own hands and they're beginning to treat themselves. So I would just say, you just gotta be kind of careful, make sure where you're getting this information that it is uh, that it is correct information. Um, I also like to say, you know, we have uh, patients of every walk of life. Uh, we have, you know, kids coming in from uh, birth trauma. We treat babies uh, all the way to grandma, but we're a very active clinic and we're using these innovative modality tools, these biohacking tools, on our patient population. And one of the big things that we um, that we talk about at Physiologic when you become a patient is we teach the patient. We don't, you know, you're coming in, you're, everybody's a science experiment. Um, you know, we really make sure to understand that you're the boss, we're your managers, we're just gonna give you treatment options. And we expect that kind of like back and forth banter because at the end of the day, you're the boss, you're gonna tell us what you wanna do. Versus, you know, back in the days where like our grandparents, the doc would walk in with a white lab jacket and be like, you know, you're going to take this pill for your ill. And there wasn't really anything else said. You know, it's really cool that, um, in my opinion, how uh, healthcare has evolved and how uh, patients are coming in. And it is that patient doctor uh, uh, relationship where you're having that banter back and forth. And it's always the, like, hey, doc, why are you recommending this? You know, what are you seeing? Why are you saying that I should be doing, you know, you know, this modality? And I think that's really kind of where the term, the biohacking, um, you know, phrase came in. People really wanted to kind of take their health care into their, their own hands. But again, I'm going to keep repeating myself. It's having that expert to be able to banter back and forth so you're not wasting time or money. So long story short, we try to, at Physiologic, we try to instill everybody's biohacking, um, you know, like inner child, if you will. We're trying to get everybody from every walk of life to be their own biohacker. Um, Sasha, if you want to progress that slide. And we kind of went over this, um, you know, all the different 
modalities, uh, one thing like, for example, hyperbaric oxygen therapy, regenerative medicine, uh, we're performing uh, uh, PRP uh, procedures, orthopedic procedures to repair damaged orthopedic tissues, uh, bone marrow stem cell, we're a proud uh, affiliate program of Regenex, which is the, um, I would say, the largest, most reputable orthobiologic affiliate program on the planet. Um, so we're operating under Regenex's protocols. Um, and again, Pilates, we are also a teacher certification center. If you want to progress that slide, Sasha. So I think I covered everything. How'd that go, Sasha? What were your thoughts? Did I miss anything? No, I think uh, I think that went well. Thank you. We do have a few questions that have come in, and guys, please ensure to um, paste your questions in the um, Q and A down below, or just to chat them over. And if you do want to ask a question out loud, I can unmute you and allow you to have volume. So just let me know, and we can go from there. But one of the things, and I think this is a great question, um, and just based on, you know, weeding out the noise that is out there uh, within the, the biohacking um, space is there's a question that came in in regards to, you know, what is the process of peptide therapy? Who is a potential candidate? And what are the... Um, the positive effects that can be seen from peptides. Obviously, there is a, a, a ton of peptides that are out there. So I think it's weeding out which ones, you know, can be used for who and why. That's a good one. Wow. Um, yeah, there's, that's a funny one, because we talk about that in so many different uh, uh, biohacking, um, functional medicine forums that I'm involved with, from patients all the way to physicians and so on and so forth. Um, and this is, again, where do I get my advice? Uh, I'm very versed. I've sat through hours and hours and hours over the last, I don't know, seven years on, uh, on, on peptide education. And um, I've experimented with a variety of different ones. Uh, but I always go to our resident expert, Dr. Patty de Blasio, medical doctor, that she's, you know, really putting her nose in. And that's that's usually who the person that I'm getting prescribed from and getting an advice from. But what what is a peptide? Um, I don't know if you guys have heard of it, but what is a peptide? So they're naturally occurring. We have them in our body. Uh, amino acid chains. So what is an amino acid? Amino acid is the building block for a protein. So you get these uh, chains of amino acids that form a peptide. And you know, it's, it's pretty interesting on uh, how popular be, they have been becoming and, and how uh, synergistic they are for a lot of people's kind of healthcare journey. It's not the magic bullet. Um, I, I You're going to hear me say that quite a bit throughout the course of the day. Um, I think we are way too complex um, as being human beings. I don't think there's one magic bullet. And sometimes I've seen a lot of the information out there that is being... Um, kind of presented as the magic bullet. Um, and there is a lot of misinformation, a lot of people that are kind of talking about it that don't have the, the, the background to really guide and lead people. And unfortunately, uh, peptides are only supposed to be prescribed, um, but there is a workaround. There's some uh, companies out there that are doing research on them. And uh, you can, the end user, you can get this peptide shipped or mailed to you, um, and you're basically part of their research program. So anything that I'm putting in my body, um, I'm very, I have a tendency to be a little bit careful, a little bit conservative, but I am a biohacker myself. I've been one, as, as I said, kind of my whole life, um, but I've been very careful what I put in my body. And I, you know, there's macro dose and micro dose. I always like, you know, even with our patients, we micro dose with people, but um, if you don't know what you're doing in that space, if you're giving yourself the wrong peptide, you can cause adverse reactions. You really need to make sure that you're getting it from a prescription-based company. Uh, they're called compounding pharmacies. You don't want to be putting something in you that you don't know where it's coming from. That's not FDA regulated. Um, uh, peptides are, uh, there are so many of them. Uh, this gets into, you know, not even like adverse reactions, but you wasting your time or your money. You could be spending money on a peptide that you read or heard a podcast that you might not, you might not need in your pathway. And I look at peptides 
um, here comes the terrible analogies that my wife makes fun of me for. Think of yourself driving down the driving down or in Brooklyn, the BQE. Okay. And there's, you know, four lanes of uh, traffic and there's little potholes in that BQE so that you're still able to drive down the BQE. But if you keep hitting these potholes, it's not going to make for an ideal drive. You've not been optimized, shall we say. I look at peptides as almost like filling in those potholes. Okay. Um, but if you have uh, foundational health issues, Meaning, if your car is so broken that you can't even drive down the uh, drive down the BQE, what's the sense of filling the bottles? Meaning, foundational health: Are you drinking clean water? Are you eating clean, nourishing food? Are you sleeping? Are you smoking? Are you drinking a bottle of scotch before you go to sleep and watching a horror movie on blue light TV? All of those things are way more powerful in a net negative pattern than any peptide could be. So as long as you have, like if you're an uncontrolled type two diabetic, um, if you don't have that controlled and you're trying to look at a peptide as being a magic bullet, you're going too far down the line. You need to find more foundational health. You need to clean yourself up. You need to take some like preliminary strides where I look at peptides as, as you have your, if you're in a disease state or a pre-disease state, if you have that under control, peptides are really an unbelievable thing that can kind of like optimize and fill in some of those gaps. I can tell you that big pharma does not really like peptides. Why? Because they are almost as strong, if not strong, as some of the pharmaceutical agents that we're utilizing. However, peptides are naturally occurring amino acids. So I think if you remember this part of the conversation, peptides are going to, um, I don't want to say revolutionize the healthcare environment, but they're going to really, uh, they're not going away, but they just need to be used in a more professional setting. Sasha, do you, you know, we've, we've had this conversation because we've been talking a lot about peptides internally at Physiologic because we get a, a ton of phone calls about them. What it like from a consumer standpoint and like a marketing standpoint, you know, we've had, what, what are your thoughts? Yeah, no, thanks, Dr. Rudy. I mean, a lot of us are getting and, and obtaining information from either, as Dr. Rudy mentioned, podcasts or, or Instagram channels or even influencers for that matter. So I think the most important thing to weed out the myths from the truths or, you know, the garbage from the, from the real stuff is to ensure that whoever you are following and whoever is giving, you know, direction in terms of, you know, what you should be taking directions you should be going in um, is to know that they are actually certified. So, you know, specifically as it comes to, you know, medical things and, and injectables. Um, so ensure that, you know, you are following a doctor that is an influencer and you can ask these questions and, you know, get responses within the Instagram or that you are following podcasts like a Dr. Mark Hyman, or, you know, you can follow our po podcast, Funk You Up. I mean, just to understand that, um, you know, you are getting the good stuff, you are getting the quality, um, you know, uh, information, and you're not being told to go in one direction that may not pertain to your body. Because as Dr. Rudy said at Physiologic, we look at everybody as an individual, and not every um, service that we offer may pertain to that individual, just based on the direction that they want to go with in life, and you know, what, what ailments they have. So I think, number one is know who your influencer is and the information that you're absorbing within um, our platforms of social media today. Yeah, good point, Sasha. One other thing before I get off that, sorry, I didn't mean to talk so much about it, but also, you know, knowing, uh, you know, an aura ring or, you know, a whoop or something like that, you're really not going to get under your biochemical hood. Um, it's going to give you some good data, but, you know, I, I would not be spending time nor money without having labs. And, you know, maybe we can talk about labs for just a second, but, you know, more advanced lab testing to really get on your, your, you know, your, your, your chemical hood to figure out what you're deficient in, what you have too much in, you know, from advanced blood, uh, uh, comprehensive blood analysis is at the very least bottom of the bucket. Um, that I would say, you know, if you don't have that, if you've not had your blood checked in a while, how do you know you need peptides? Uh, there's a lot of advanced stool testing 
or microbiome testing, 70 to 80% of your immune system lives in your GI tract, uh, really helpful information. And again, that's a test of, you know, what do you, what do you have in overabundance, possibly some pathogenic bacteria or parasites, um, you know, yeast, mold, what are you deficient in? Because if your microbiome isn't working, you could have absorption problems. It could be causing autoimmune conditions. You know, um, there's advanced genetic testing, there's salivary hormone testing. So just like before you really kind of dive down and start self-treating, you really got to understand what, you know, kind of how you look at a chemical level just for your own safety. And again, to not waste time nor money. Good question. Yeah. Thanks, Sasha. Yes, there is a question that came in about gut health. And I think that that's a really good segue. Um, how can biohacking techniques be implemented to optimize gut health? And we did do a post on this in, in connection to, you know, the gut and the brain. And I think really, I mean, it is, it is the operating system of your body. So I think it's, I think this is a great question. I mean, and what are the potential benefits for overall physiological well, well-being? So I think let's just break down, you know, gut health and connection to the brain and so on and so forth and just your overall well-being. Yeah, for sure. So again, this is, you know, we're talking biohacking. So we're talking, this is the superhuman crowd that we're talking to. We're not talking to the pathologic, right? But we do. All of our functional medicine patients, um, we're doing microbiome testing. Um, I personally, uh, we test my five-year-old daughter. My wife gets tested on the regular at least once a year, try to do twice a year. Um, I get, I get tested one to two times a year. A little bit about my, my health history. Um, I suffered from six pretty significant, uh, concussions, sports injuries. Um, so we'll talk about brain health in a sec from that conversation and how that's applicable to microbiome. And I was, was also a uh, number of years ago, uh, trail running and I got bit by a tick and uh, really kind of hack and biohack uh, Lyme's disease. So, um, and recently got bit again. So it's really important, your microbiome, I like to call it your jungle. Um, you know, that one, if you if you think back to kind of like middle, middle uh, school, like ecology class, that one little bug in the jungle, upstream and downstream, if that bug disappears, you know, how that affects the jungle and the ecosystem and everything, you know, from the predators that are eating it all the way down to that bug, what it's pollinating and how it really can kind of affect your, 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 the, the health of the jungle. So your GI tract, as I said, 70 to 80% of your immune system lives in your GI tract. If your immune system is not optimized, you're a professional athlete, you're a young uh, weekend warrior, uh, you're trying to live till you're 120. If, if, you're, if you're not optimized in your GI tract, you're really kind of selling yourself short. And there's some testing that's really like available and not expensive at all. I think it's like 300 bucks to get it tested. Um, and then having someone that can kind of translate the data, but it's essentially looking at what you have too much in and what you don't have enough out. So as I said before, pathogenic, what's that word? Bad. If you have a buildup of bad things, or if you have an infection somewhere in your GI tract, long-term, long-standing, uh, one example would be SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth can lead to, this is just one of many, but can lead to um, uh, intestinal impermeability or what's formerly known as leaky gut, where you're basically leaking uh, toxins in your bloodstream, which is one of the leading causes or thought to be causes of autoimmune conditions. And uh, Sasha, thank you, Sasha, you know, that, that gut brain barrier, we're starting to look at, you know, what is our primary brain? Is our GI system actually our primary brain? Or is our, is our primary brain our primary brain? But there's so much like uh, communication back and forth between our GI tract and our brain. If you've got uh, an unhealthy GI system, I can guarantee you that you're going to have an unhealthy brain and vice versa. Hence why I get tested on the regular for sports concussions, because I know if I can optimize my GI scorecard, if you will, or my report card, I know I'm going to be healthier as a whole. I know that my Lyme's disease, Lyme being a predator in this situation, and it waits 
sits in the kind of deep, dark, nasty places of your body, and it waits for you to have a healthcare crisis. But if my immune system is optimized, and it's as strong as an ox, I know that uh, that Lyme's disease is going to stay dormant and just sit there and have to kind of wait. Um, but yeah, I can't, I can't urge enough, even if you're just trying to like live a healthy lifestyle, I could argue where GI testing um, is, is as important, if not more important than comprehensive blood analysis. Did that cover that, Sasha? Did I... Yeah, that totally covered it and, and leads into the segue, which I think would be interesting to talk through is the HBOT um, experience. Um, and so really the question that came through is, you know, who is an ideal candidate for HBOT and which medical conditions or health challenges um, does, uh, you know, do, do we recommend for somebody to be using HBOT? But then I also think on the flip side, if you don't have medical challenges, how can HBOT also benefit you just in terms of biohacking and longevity and health and wellness in life. Okay, got it. Good question. Um, I'm I'm certified in hyperbaric oxygen medicine. Um, I've been we've had hyperbaric oxygen therapy since I think 2018, and it's been uh, I was researching it prior to uh, us having a chamber. Shout out to uh, HBOT USA and Dr. Jason Saunders, who I mentored, um, that they're positioned in uh, his main clinic is in New Jersey. So I got to kind of see it firsthand. Um, but we have, we have uh, you know, there's professional athletes back to biohacking, like Le uh, LeBron is one of the first people that really kind of publicized that he had a hyperbaric chamber in his, uh, in his practice. A lot of NBA players. A lot of NFL players that have home chambers, um, again, just to kind of like recover and optimize. But we have patients coming in, um, you know, that we're doing synergistic supportive treatment, you know, all the way from uh, cancers, uh, you know, autoimmune conditions and you, you name it. I'm, I'm a little bit biased. I'm a, I'm a classic cynic when it comes to uh, modalities. I go in purposely as a cynic and I have to see it in, uh, from my very own eyes. Um, I self, I was, I was um, observing New Jersey HBOT and uh, at the time just researching that uh, at the time I was still trying to like hack Lyme disease. Uh, my daughter had a vaccine accident at the same time. So that really kind of fast tracked us into getting that chamber. Um, and it's been kind of like no looking back. Uh, we started off treating our myself, uh, my family. We were I, uh, a friend that's a professional backcountry skier that was in doing some regenerative medicine stuff, staying with me. But she came in with another acute um, concussion as they're always sitting her head off of rocks. And she cleared up her concussion, cleared up. We did acute protocols very quickly. I am, again, I'm, I'm biased. I think hyper, I think oxygen therapies in general fall under the foundational health bucket where who wouldn't do better with them? Who wouldn't do better with a hack on delivering the most important nutrient, which is called oxygen? How can I say that so um, uh, confidently? What is the one nutrient that you're going to disappear very quickly with? Oxygen. You're gone within two to four minutes. Water takes a couple of days. Macro, micronutrients, food take a couple of weeks. So in that example, every cell in your body requires oxygen at a cellular level uh, to make energy in the electron transport chain. It's the, it's, the, it's the raw essential nutrient in that to produce energy at a cellular level. If that cell can't produce ATP in the mitochondria, it'll die. So I think, you know, Israel, kudos to Israel. Israel is doing a lot of research. They're kind of like the leaders in using it for their off-label and uh, on-label. Um, every institutional hospital in the United States has hyperbaric oxygen chambers in their wound healing centers. So if you're, <laughs> excuse me, 80% burned, they're going to throw you in a hyperbaric chamber to keep you alive. There's some other on-label, but there's a lot of off-label um, as I said, you know, Lyme, chronic Lyme, a lot of viral issues, bacterial issues, cancer. So, you know, if you talk host uh, theory for one second, we have things that we're hosting that are not good for us that are pathogenic. Cancer cells hate oxygen. Most 
pathogenic bacteria or anaerobes, which mean they don't like oxygen. Viruses don't like oxygen. So if you're nuking your body with oxygen, those things can't replicate. They don't like it. Every cell in your body likes oxygen. Every cell requires oxygen. So we always get the question, why not just go on concentrated oxygen? Why hyperbaric? The hack, the magic is when you put a, a person under pressure, the oxygen shrinks and it's able to dissolve into the plasma of the blood. And you're able to hyperoxygenate the patient while they're in the chamber. But the big thing is you're able to, you're able to push it deep into the microcirculation that's damaged and kind of like I'm going to call it downstream in areas that don't have the ability through your normal circulatory system to get that oxygen. So anything downstream past that point, those, those cells, if they're still alive, are deficient or starving for oxygen. So you're feeding them, revitalizing them. But again, in the dark uh, depths of your body, that's where the bad stuff lives. So you're feeding the good, making it unhospitable for the bad. Was that the whole, I, I'm sorry to go off on a tangent on that one. Did that answer your question, Sasha? Yeah, totally. And then one of our um, listeners had a question and she asked, does hyperbaric help with autism, ADHD, or multiple sclerosis? Yes, all of the above. Okay. If you go to our Instagram page, I'll get into it to answer the question shortly. And this is, this is a uh, from an emotional standpoint, me being a father. Um, you know, we had a uh, we had a vaccine accident that hit home with us. My daughter did not respond well, had a seizure, um, and our first line of defense was putting her into a hyperbaric chamber that Saturday morning and a lot of cellular detoxes. Uh, we were very quick to act on that, and um, autism. Uh, CP, uh, we have those patients coming in and, you know, that, that hits home for a family and that, that is, uh, I can't imagine, you know, I can't imagine, uh, that affecting our family because of the long-term, uh, disability that, that, that family occurs. And like, you know, just even being a parent, uh, my empathy, you know, cause knowing that you're likely going to live a lot of times longer than your kids, and just knowing that your child is going to get uh, taken care of. So um, if you look at our Instagram, um, I'm trying to think of how long ago it was, maybe we can send out a uh, send out that link in a, in a follow up. But there was a mother that uh, of a CP patient that did a testimonial for us. And she actually wants to do another one because the, the daughter is doing so well. But in the hyperbaric world, um, it almost brings tears to my eyes. There's, uh, we always talk about the times where the kids say their first words or make uh, uh, huge um, uh, advancements in their in their neurologic uh, world uh, in the clinics, in the hyperbaric chamber or afterwards. So it's very common uh, amongst hyperbaric uh, uh, clinics when we're talking about autistic kids while they just had their first words in our office. And it kind of brings tears to everybody. But that was one thing when I was at New Jersey HBOT. Um, they had different uh, uh, demographics of patients coming in. Mornings, evenings, like working people, you know, people with uh, the professional athlete all the way to the person that was, you know, going through oncology radiology that was also doing supportive care with, with HBOT. But then uh, in the afternoons was the developmental children. And their families coming in, it really was gut wrenching, but it was beautiful in the sense that I got to speak to their parents and, you know, the before and after and all these things and like, oh, now they're able to talk and everything else. And, you know, we have, I have uh, parents sending us um, you know, recorded messages of their, their kids starting to sing nursery rhymes and things like that. But it, without going too deep into it, if you do a little, uh, a little bit of digging and I can uh, maybe if you want to do a consult with me after uh, after this, I can give you uh, the pathways on how it works. But it, it super saturates the brain um, with oxygen into the the areas that need detoxification and need revitalization. But it, it's it's remarkable to see these kids. Uh, it, it's not the magic bullet. They're not like you know. Um, it's not reversing. It's it's just a really incredible synergistic tool for for these kids that need it. I hope that answered your question. I'd love to uh, dig further with you. I'd be more than happy to. 
Yeah, I will. I will reach out to to the um, participant, um, Dr. Rudy. Thank you. Um, yeah. That testimony you're you're talking about from the HBOT um, was uh, Nishmaya's mom, right? Yep. Correct. CV. Okay. Mm -hmm. We have that on our, I sent that to the participant who asked the question, but for anyone else, we have um, a few testimonials and she is on there on our website. We have more on our Instagram account that we're um, slowly uploading to the site. Um, but thank you. That was a uh, very good question. One came a very good answer to those questions. Um, I'm not sure if this is related, but how do you work with someone with cervical let me make sure I'm pronouncing this right. Melopathy or cerebral syndrome arthritis. Myelopathy maybe is how you pronounce it. M-Y-E-L-O-P. Yeah. Um, is it, what is the cause? Was there something pressing? Was there an acute injury? If you want to unmute, we can leave your name um, out of it, or you can just speak through Sasha. But what was the mechanism of injury? Okay, so let's see here. Um, and if that guest needs a couple of minutes, but if you can just give me a little bit uh, previous medical history on uh, how that diagnosis arose. Was there any type of metabolic uh, driver? Was it more of a physical mechanism of injury? Anything that, uh, you know, uh, genetic, anything that you can kind of share with me that I can better... Uh, answer your question. Okay, they asked the question anonymous, so I will wait for them to um, respond yeah. to that question. If we don't get a response, maybe we can move to the next question, and then I can come back to that one. Yeah, absolutely. And just so, to speak. Mm -hmm. I have two more questions here. Uh, we can get to those two. How does NAD therapy uh, work to optimize cellular health? I think this is like a nice add-on to the HBOT. Um, and what benefits can participants expect to experience as a result of undergoing this treatment? I think there is a lot of noise about NAD similar to peptides. So I think it would be just interesting to talk about ways in which um, we deliver NAD. And again, people who have ailments or people who are just looking to optimize as well, I think will benefit from it. Okay. But just what is it and how does it help? Is that the summary of the question? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, it's actually NAD plus, so it's the oxidized version of NAD. Um, NAD should be same thing, careful of your source. Um, just because, you know, if you're getting uh, a bad source, if you're getting an uh, expired source, as I said, it's an oxidized version. So you want to get it while it's, you know, in its perfect form, uh, oxidized meaning at the proper pH. So it's not harmful and it's effective. I think that's really, 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 really important. Um, wowzers, NAD, I am, uh, that's another, like, I can't believe we don't have more NAD um, uh, for all, you know, for all people. It's, it, you know, I'll explain the pathway in a second, but it is fascinating on how powerful and effective that is. What, what is NAD plus? NAD plus is a B3 derivative. It's niacin. It's a B vitamin. But when I, you know, I was like, oh, B vitamin, you know, I, I can just take B vitamins uh, over the counter. How powerful is it? It is, uh, it is a really powerful vitamin. And a lot of the people are talking about it, have been talking about it in the biohacking world um, in IVs in particular, and we'll get back to that. But if you don't believe me, how powerful a, uh, NAD treatment is try an IV. Oh my God. It is fascinating feeling it going through your body, but I promise you, I can, I can, uh, say to you, we have, uh, we use it for pathology in our clinic on the regular basis and man, how it turns people around. It's fascinating. I'll get into that, but also from someone that's just trying to be a Superman, like who would not benefit from NAD therapy? I, as a matter of fact, uh, a couple hours ago, uh, every morning, I give my daughter a half of an NAD uh, from real NAD sublingual. Every morning, we take it as a family. But um, NAD, what is the pathway back to uh, middle school biochem class? Uh, on the cellular level, each cell has a mitochondria, which is the powerhouse of your cell. Um, the electron transport chain, I just talked about that with uh, with hyperbaric. 
Um, in that electron transport chain, what is the end goal? It's to make cellular energy or ATP in the cell. Um, oxygen, as I said before, is a raw nutrient uh, or raw material needed in that pathway, as is NAD, NAD+. Plus. So NAD is naturally occurring in our body, but in our toxic environment, toxic, I mean, who we live in New York City. We're breathing pollution from... You know, the storms in Canada, there's, you know, we live in a toxic world, generally speaking. Plastic, you can go on till the cows come home about the toxic environment. Even if we're living a very clean lifestyle, we still are in a toxic environment. We naturally deplete our NAD levels. So I can argue everybody should, in fact, uh, at some point, um, dose with NAD at certain times of their life. Um, I think it's important also to understand how to deliver it. So a lot of times, um, I think in these conversations you'll have with us, we're very, per very particular on how we deliver things. What does that mean? Um, where do you need NAD? So if you need it in a, in a particular system, we're going to fast track and try to get it there. But for like a general health perspective, sublinguals work really well. Um, uh, they still do have to get through the liver. Um, if you're trying to get like a bigger dose, if you're, uh, you know, definitely if you're doing something from a medical condition, or if you really want kind of a boost uh, to be that Superman, IVs are really, uh, really helpful from time to time. Um, but also with, uh, you know, uh, central nervous system or upper motor neuron patients, um, we can deliver sinus sprays of NAD, trying to bypass the blood brain barrier, getting directly into the central nervous system, but we also do a procedure called uh, using a sphenocath, um, which is not an injection, but we're going all the way back to your frontal sinus. There's a little back door, um, without getting too nerdy in this, but there's a little back door to your blood brain barrier that we can access and kind of saturate and bypass that blood brain barrier. Um, there's subcutaneous injections, there's uh, uh, skin um, uh, treatments that you can do, but I would say kind of the most bang for your buck uh, would be IVs, um, everyday sublingual, uh, and if you have uh, an issue that's brain-based or central nervous system, uh, I would really consider looking for someone that knows how to use a spinal cath or at the very least nasal sprays. Um, again, I can argue uh, every human being uh, should be on a somewhat regular basis be using NAD plus on, on, uh, from a, pre a preventative medicine standpoint. Definitely, definitely if you have medical conditions and we can kind of get into that maybe at a later talk on why that is, but every cell in your body requires it for that electron transport chain. Um, it also detoxifies your body pretty, uh, pretty amazingly. If you look up, um, if you're looking at more modern uh, drug and detox clinics, the NED treatments are now commonplace for opioid or alcohol detoxification. So if you're healthy and it can detox a heroin addict, man, that thing must be really good for the healthy person. Thank you, Dr. Rudy. That cover was that, great. Sasha? Yeah, totally. And when you say sublingual, you mean like the, the, um, the actual like capsules, right? Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Thank you for saying that. You can get NAD in like a little sublingual tablet that you just melt it on your mouth. So it's when I say sublingual melting onto your tongue, it's going to get more into your bloodstream. Um, we're trying to kind of bypass your liver at that point. So your body can absorb it a little bit more. Okay. Now back to the question. Thank you for getting back to us. Um, the person that asked, how do you work with someone with cervical Myelopathy, I think is how you put it. Uh -huh. Or cerebral syndrome arthritis. And they wrote back and they said the ju it was an injury, uh, bone com uh, compression, uh, cervical spine arthritis around that area from an injury. I'm going to say that back to you. So uh, a cervical myelopathy with associated arthritis. And it sounded like it was a compressive force injury. Yeah. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. There's not an age on that, is there? Uh, if you can let us know the age, we can go into a little bit more detail. Yeah. I'll go into it regardless, though. Okay. Um, that's a good question. So um, 
compressive forces. I mean, you hear like, you know, all the time someone dumped in, uh, jumped into the shallow side of the pool by mistake and had a compressive force in their cervical spine. Sometimes that can uh, create acute fractures all the way to motor vehicle accidents. Um, I had my first disc herniation in my cervical spine. Sorry, a cervical spine meaning neck myelopathy, meaning um, we're damaging central nervous system tissue. So you got your brain, you've got your brain stem and everything kind of like from your brain stem down is uh, before your shoulders is your cervical spine and your cervical vertebrae uh, um, protect that. Obviously your skull protects your brain. Um, but if you had some type of compressive force in your neck, um, you have bones in your neck and you have intervertebral discs, um, which act as like little shock absorbers. You can crack those discs um, and you can basically crack the disc and start putting pressure on your either your spinal cord that lives directly behind it or one of the exiting nerve roots off the side. Both are you know considered central nervous system tissue uh, that technically do not have Schwann cells or reproductive cells. So there can be, when we're dealing with Spinal cord injuries, uh, you know, some things can be permanent, but it sounds to me like she's having some neurologic damage plus uh, associated arthritis. Again, um, I got, uh, I have a head down, got uh, checked really hard, broke my nose. I think I was 14, broke my nose. Uh, I can't remember what concussion that was, but my neck went back and did uh, like a whiplash uh, and knocked me out. And uh, subsequently I cracked one of those little discs in my neck. Um, so it's not an age thing. It's more of like a wear and tear thing that can be associated with uh, later in life, um, you know, degradation or arthritis, or it could be a traumatic mechanism of injury when you're, you know, you're younger and it kind of creates this damage profile. Um, but you can, you can essentially injure yourself. You can injure your spinal cord by like a long tensing moment. And if you kind of look at that, I often think of circulation. You can create damage to the microcirculation in that area. That's what we already kind of talked about. If you're creating damage to that microcirculation, then you know that you're not going to be getting the nutrients, uh, platelets, and other, you know, uh, a variety of things that come and heal that tissue. So um, I know this is a biohacking conversation and people are trying to be, um, you know, kind of like superhuman, but we're going to go conventional medicine versus innovative medicine. Um, if typically the way that we look at these injuries, if it was a compressive force, we're going to start decompressing the patient. We're going to take a look at the shape of the spine. And if that curve is gone, that perfect curve that mother nature gave you, if you lose it or reverse it, you're starting to tense that brainstem and brain itself because normally it's supposed to be sitting like that. But if you're pulling on central nervous system back to that microcirculation, you're going to create circulatory problems um, in that area. So you're going to create more long-term damage. Um, if the shape of your spine has been changed again from that traumatic event, um, you're now more prone to degenerative disc disease and degenerative joint disease, which is AKA arthritis in your spine. If the arthritis uh, evolves and gets worse, you can get what's known as osteophytes uh, forming or bone spurs that can also little hooks that are going to lay down in areas of pressure. And you're going to get this like little reactive bone formation that can also start pressing into uh, spinal tissue, your spinal canal causing more injury. Um, moving on to our regenerative medicine procedures. Um, that's when these kind of outside of like standard physical therapy and chiropractic care, uh, regenerative medicine and the Regenex procedures that we do at Physiologic by Dr. Tunush Palvia um, definitely are 15, 20 years ahead of conventional medicine, um, different than you might have uh, undergone like, you know, uh, uh, epidurals or, you know, steroid injections. Yes, we do those. But if we're trying to repair uh, tissue, uh, we may elect to do an epidural, which is going into the spinal canal, essentially, in layman's terms, with frozen PRP or PRP lysate, uh, which has a healing and a natural anti-inflammatory uh, um, 
uh, solution for the spinal cord and exiting nerve roots. Um, we also do PRP, which we like to we I like to think of it as almost like a biologic superglue. So if you have cervical instability because of that injury, duct pelvia can go in through the posterior and hit all those posterior ligaments where the bone is held together um, uh, to other bones via ligaments. So if that bone is unstable, we can hit it with PRP and re restabilize it to stop the bones from shifting, shall we say. Um, all of our regenerative medicine uh, patients all get a complementary hyperbaric oxygen uh, treatment as well. And where this really comes into play, because if you have spinal cord damage, again, you know, I, I look at it as also a circulatory issue that if your microcirculation is damaged in that area, you got bad things, you got pathogenic things uh, growing the, in those areas in a disease state. When, they, um, when we dissect cadavers and we test the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the biochemistry, we find pathogenic bacteria in arthritic joints. Why? Because no circulation is getting into that area or, in, or improper circulation. So all that we're trying to do with, um, you know, with regenerative medicine treatments, we're basically hyper-concentrating the magic that lives in your blood and we're uh, injected in concentrated form specific to that area. And then what a great logistic tool, hyperbaric oxygen therapy, we're shrinking the oxygen, get pushing it through the microcirculation and rejuvenating the cells that are in that area, but also feeding the new cells that are trying to grow with oxygen and making it an unhospitable environment for any pathogens that are living in there. So Dr. Rudy, thank you for that. The age was 66. I don't know if there needs to be any additional commentary added to that. Yeah, I think, I mean, the reason I asked that, so, you know, not that, um, uh, there's no age that can't be helped, shall we say. There's always something that we can do. Is there a magic bullet that will quote unquote fix you? But there's always some type of synergistic tool to put you in a healing state if you're, if we're doing the right thing. Um, I'd be more than happy to, I think there's an offer at the end, more than happy to do a, a consult with you to kind of give you a different options that we could provide. Or if, if you don't live in New York City, um, i glad to put you in contact with uh, other Regenix clinics, other rehab clinics, things like that. But there's so many different things. All that I can urge you to do is anytime, you know, we're always, in essence, we're always degenerating. How do you slow down that clock, how do we slow down the degeneration? And there's a lot of things that you can be doing for yourself. I sent the participant um, your email as well as info at, um, just because I don't know who it is. Um, and okay. yeah, and I'll let, and we'll go through the offer in the end here. Um, I do have a question that came in from another participant. Um, hello there. What can you recommend for plantar fasciitis treatment? And um, and the participant, by the way, who asked the question that you just answered, just thank th thanked you for all the information. Oh, my pleasure, my honor. Plantar fasciitis. I'm a plantar fasciitis sufferer from time to time as well. Um, I always I look at uh, I look at anatomical shapes first. I think that's uh, the way my brain works. Is always why is something happening? Um, is there any deviation from what mother nature intended on giving us? What the heck does that mean? Um, do you, you know, you look at your arch, why is your plantar fascia, uh, why does it have, you know, potentially a tear? Why does it have, we'll just call it for ease of conversation, muscle spasms that leads to kind of like an inflammatory condition that is really painful, I can tell you. Um, but it's always, what is your, what is the arch of your foot look like? Do you have ligament instability, um, in your arch joints that's creating a flat foot phenomenon? So if you now have a flat foot, you don't have that shock absorber. So I would say kind of like the conventional medicine, um, you know, is like throw an arch support in there and, you know, take oral anti-inflammatories and kind of call it a day. I like to look at that, uh, that anatomy. I like to look at the, uh, the patient's age, uh, if you're a plantar fasciitis patient, and if you have pes planus or flat feet, which is very common um, in that, you know, in that pathology, um, if you're an adolescent, I, I'm very reluctant to give people orthotics because I don't want that kid married to orthotics the rest of his life. 
Uh, we're going to do kind of everything that we can to keep them out of orthotics versus if I have a 90 year old patient that has a severe amount of um, ligament instability, their foot's flat on the ground, that plantar fascia is getting pulled all the time. You know, there's, there's only so much you can kind of do from a rehab standpoint and a ligament laxity standpoint. Uh, again, ligaments hold bone to bone, but if your bones are, are, you know, are flattening and you don't have the muscle control to keep it up, that's where these, these conditions can be very uh, kind of chronic. So kind of assessing, does the patient really need an orthotic? And if you're going to build an orthotic, should it be more of like a neurologic orthotic versus locking the patient's foot down? I would, we always go more conservative. Again, my goal is to always, just like medication, like we might put a patient on medication, but our goal is to always get them out of it. Our goal is always get you out of the orthotics. I, 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 I have like a handshake agreement with patients. I'm going to give you this orthotic. I'm going to make it very loose, a neurologic one, for example, that's just going to kind of point your foot neurologically in the right direction, but I, I'm handshaking that you're going to do prescribed exercises to strengthen your feet. Because if your foot is strong, if your muscle is strong, then I know there's less chance for future tears, complete tears, or inflammatory cascades. Another thing we always give uh, shoe consults. No one is straight. Everybody is a little bit crooked. People walk in New York City with their bag on one shoulder, as an example. Um, we wear down our shoes. We wear down our shoes asymmetrically. So if your shoe is you know, supposed to be flat like this, but if it's torqued out, you're basically putting your, your shoe as a brace, whatever position you put your foot in in that, in that brace, you're yanking on your tissue. So, you know, finding a good shoe cobbler, making sure you're wearing straight shoes, not worn out shoes, because even if you need an orthotic, your orthotic's not going to work in a crooked shoe. Also assessing, making sure you have a full diagnosis you know, if it's something chronic, has someone done an ultrasound or, or an MRI to assess if, if you have tears? So besides physical therapy, you know, besides just uh, corticosteroid injections, it is not fun to get a steroid injection in your plantar fascia, by the way. But, you know, uh, this is where PRP comes into play um, for that, uh, that biologic superglue. So again, PRP is a concentrated uh, um, uh, form of platelets. Your platelets are uh, what heals when you have a cut on your arm. That's what scabs. So if you can inject into micro tears or a chronic condition, specifically the plantar fascia, it'll restabilize that tissue. It'll tighten that tissue up over a period of time. But again, rehab is very important. Uh, coaching on uh, types of shoes and, and so on and so forth. I hope that answered your question. Thank you, Dr. Rudy. Please ask us any additional questions to that answer. Um, we have time for one more question, which came through. Um, uh, this is the, um, how does physiologic approach hormone balancing and therapy? And what are the benefits for individuals experiencing hormone imbalances? And I think that this would be a really good opportunity to kind of plug in some of the um, services that we offer um, more geared towards uh, the females um, that are in attendance of this webinar. Okay, Sasha, just a question one more time, hormone balancing, and then what was the second part? So um, how do we approach hormone balancing and what are the benefits? Okay, got it. Um, wow, that's uh, can we start the second webinar right now? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> That's a good one. yeah, yeah. I mean, hormones, that is, um, God, you talk to like, who doesn't have the uh, aunt complaining about menopausal changes, right? You, we've all heard it. And, uh, you know, I look at hormones as kind of like your control board. And, you know, from an anti aging standpoint, if your hormones are unbalanced, um, you know, from a, a, a mental health standpoint, like, you know, if someone's, if they're, if your hormones are unbalanced, how that can wreak havoc into your body. So it is really important to feel good. And like, you know, even talking to the biohackers on a, a lot of these forums, you know, even with, um, you know, professional bodybuilders and power lifters and CrossFitters, we're kind of always taking, taking a look at, let me jump into the guys really quick, but like testosterone levels and 
you know, I, I on, a, on a regular basis, um, every time I get my blood checked, I'm always checking me being the guy, I'm always checking my testosterone levels. And I'm always trying to naturally balance my hormone levels, which we'll get into in a second. Um, because if my hormone levels are off, man, I feel like junk, you know, and even vitamin D is now considered, not now considered, but it's not a vitamin, it's actually a hormone. But if you're, you know, if you're, if your computer system in your body, your hormones that kind of regulate your pathways, if your hormones are off, man, you feel like junk, you feel old, you're not sleeping properly, you can't manage stress. So I can't urge you enough to make sure that on a regular basis, either being your functional medicine provider, um, it being your primary care physician, always implore your docs that are running your labs to check your male and female hormones and make sure you've got them optimized as much as possible. Um, this is, I'm going to be long winded on this one, Sasha, don't yell at me. I'm sorry. But, um, you know, there's lab, uh, lab high, lab low. Your lab ranges are, you know, that's like in your community, your average from some guy that's six foot five of a completely different genetic makeup versus the female that's, you know, four foot one from a different completely genetic uh, uh, makeup. Your lab ranges are from low to high. And if you fall within that low to high, you're normal. But that is not your optimal. Your optimal is like right there, ladies and gentlemen. Like there's a very narrow window and knowing someone, knowing a functional medicine provider that knows how to read labs as it relates to hormones. And there's different hormones that affect other things. So you might walk into someone, you know, a primary care physician that's just going through five minute, um, uh, you know, uh, 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 visits because they're kind of like stuck in the system, not because they're not trying to help you. And that lab says that your testosterone, your estrogen is normal but you are way off on your optimal. What's like really making you, and this is where the biohacking comes in. Like, how do you really like hyper analyze your own biochemistry, man, you could be feeling like junk for no reason. Another thing, polar opposite, uh, they're called bio identical hormones, which are amazing, but if misused, not great in my subjective opinion, and objective opinion, but they're made by compounding pharmacies. Uh, physicians have to prescribe them they're made for both male and female. Um, think of it as a medication, but they're bioidentical hormones. They're the same as what you're naturally having in your body, um, but sometimes they can be overprescribed. Um, and unfortunately, if you walk into, here's the terrible analogy, if you walk into a steakhouse and I'm the steakhouse owner, and you're asking me what you should eat for dinner, what do you think I'm going to say? Steak, because that's all I'm serving. If you walk into, you know, a restaurant that has a lot to offer, I'm going to answer your question what I think would be best for you. So we offer, uh, Dr. de Blasio is our resident bioidentical hormone specialist. Um, she offers bioidentical hormones, but she's very careful when she uses them. So just like when we use antibiotics, we're really careful when we use antibiotics. That's our, you like, when we're using a medication, we have to use it, but our goal is to get you off the medication. And we're always like, is there something that we can do naturally using your own body system? Sometimes it might be peptides. Sometimes it might be um, exercise prescriptions. Sometimes, and when you're exercising, and what type of exercising? Sometimes it's nutritional and nutritional deficiencies. But we're trying to cross off those foundational health pathways before we're jumping into a pharmaceutical and in this conversation, a bioidentical um, uh, uh, agent. So if you if you have your chemistry checked, everything looks relatively good, but your hormones are just tanked, we might prescribe for a short period of time to get you over the hump, to get you through other lifestyle coaching that can naturally long term perfect or optimize your hormones, we might prescribe bioidentical hormones. Um, and from a woman's health standpoint, if you're perimenopausal, if you're menopausal, um, and even, you know, uh, uh, younger females that are coming in, a lot of times uh, conditions are hormonally based. I mean, we talk like even headaches, chronic migraines, things like that. A lot of times it's hormone based. And if we can kind of optimize 
that, and even if you're going into menopause, like why is twin sister uh, A versus twin sister C, why is A having so much more symptomatology premenopausal and going into menopause than sister B? There's so many things that you can do to just like even and make it more of a natural and like comfortable experience than having so much discomfort. Um, but that again, that is like an hour long conversation. I think on, I mean, funk you up. We can put in the show notes after some of the episodes, we cover this a lot. Uh, we are always, uh, we have a lot of hormone uh, patients from a pathological standpoint that are in disease states all the way to females that just want to feel better to males that are completely healthy, females that are completely healthy that, you know, are prof professional athletes that just want to like be the best that they can be and perform and take that cutting edge. And there's a lot of different things that you can do. Um, but I would just urge you to like, again, always make sure you're getting your labs checked. Having your hormones checked is imperative. Um, full panels, male, female, making sure you realize that what that optimal range is for you and just buyer beware. Don't just jump into bioidentical hormones make sure before you get any prescription that you've got your foundational health down and that that is not a long-term prescription that you are trying to do something from a natural health perspective uh, long-term to optimize those. And then just other stuff. I mean, you know, I heard women's, women's health. Um, we are proud to take care of our females. We love our females in our practice. I always say um, the pregnant patient is my, uh, there's, I love uh, seeing uh, pregnant females come through care. Um, we do a lot of uh, pre-labor um, work in our physical therapy department, our chiropractic department, just making sure mom is comfortable as the body changes and hormonal changes occur, just giving education so there's no issues uh, kind of after the fact, but it also comes into play with, um, you know, the baby having for, in layman's terms, we have techniques to make sure that the womb has enough um, uh, space and symmetry that the child can move around. We've all heard of, I'm assuming we've all heard of uh, breech children. Um, I had a birth trauma uh, that created chronic ear, nose, throat problems myself. Um, I was a, a forceps, a forced forceps baby. Uh, I had the umbilical cord of my mother wrapped around my neck. I was not in a good position. My mom did explain that she had um, some back issues uh, while, you know, I was in her womb. So we make sure basically that the mom is symmetrical and moving and everything is moving inside the womb. Um, it's going to lead to a, the ability to have a more comfortable, natural birth and decrease the chances as for a C-section, if at all possible. Um, it's healthier for the child as well. I, as I said, we treat uh, infants. A lot of times we'll get like uh, one of the, one of the twins in or if you think of twins in particular, it's called acute congenital torticollis. Kid comes in, you know, a couple of days after birth in to see me where they have a, a, a cervical or a neck sprain from a birth injury where, you know, the, the, uh, the infant may have been uh, forming kind of not enough uh, space in the womb. A lot of that stuff can be preventable with the techniques that we're using. Um, and a lot of times there's, you know, there's, there's birth trauma. And we've got Doc Eva on staff, who is a pelvic floor, male and female, by the way, a pelvic floor specialist. So she can go in uh, internally and do internal soft tissue manipulation if there's any type of incontinence, um, you know, uh, painful, uh, painful sex afterwards. If there's any scar tissue, as an example, uh, talking about C-sections, you know, we're seeing females, unfortunately, 10 to 15 years. Um, if, if you're a female... If I see that you've had previous children on your health uh, intake, one of my first questions is how many kids do you have? Natural or C-section? C-section, we're going to have to have conversations because if you have hip or low back pathology, I am now suspecting that that C-section was not rehab post C-section. And that is one of the mechanisms of injury because you're cutting your, you know, a large part of your abdominal uh, musculature. And a lot of times that's going to lead to um, uh, instability in your hips uh, and in your low back leading to uh, uh, joint disease uh, that we see down uh, downstream. Uh, interesting fact, a lot of times in France now, 
um, spread the word. Um, uh, France is sending their C-section females proactively to a pelvic floor physical therapist to restabilize, to prevent future uh, hip and low back injuries down the line. So um, I think that covers that question. Sorry to be long-winded in that one. No problem. Um, thank you everybody for joining. We have gone over a little, so appreciate everybody sticking through it and staying on. I think there was a lot of juicy information and some great questions that came through. Um, as we mentioned earlier, we do have a special offer. I know I've been chatting with some of you on the side, um, but um, we are offering what is normally um, at $300 from an integrative uh, medical con consult, which is now um, for this offer today. If you book it in the next 24 hours at offered at 85. Now, uh, don't forget that some of the, the um, services that we do offer are covered by insurance. So please ensure when speaking with the front desk um, care managers that you ask and as we go through the process and you meet with our practitioners and understand, you know, what direction you're going in, we can obviously, um, you know, take a look at your insurance and go through that process as well. So again, thank you. We will be sending out the recorded webinar. If you have any further questions and either yourself will reach out, our number is on the bottom of the screen, as well as our website. Um, and I also have all of our information here. If you guys want to take a picture, or screenshot it. Um, we'd love to see you guys in the office. Again, thank you so much for attending the webinar. Um, we are trying to be uh, to host these once a month. The next one that's coming up next week, um, if you're part of our newsletter, is a webinar with Dr. Pavia, who is our in-house um, regenerative medicine specialist and pain management doctor, um, and he will be going through all things um, regenerative care. Any last um, mentions, Dr. Rudy? You, Sasha, thank you so much for putting this together. Appreciate it. And uh, thank you to Evan behind the scenes as well. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Looking forward to uh, talking to you again. And um, if you have any feedback for us, you know, as I said, we're going to try to stay committed to these conversations once a month. But I would prefer not to just sit up here and just yap at you guys. I would love to have conversations. You know, I think we could all learn from each other. And, you know, thank you guys for your questions. Um, it was fun, fun chatting with you. Thank you, everybody, and hope to see you on the next webinar. Oh, considering... <laughs>